Um, hello, my name is Kieran Long. I'm the director of ArcDES, the National Center for Architecture and Design in Stockholm in Sweden, um, and one of the authors of Sigurd Leverance, Architect of Death and Life, a book um, that we released um, together with a large scale exhibition about the life and work of Sigurd Leverance um, about a year and a half ago now, um, and has been for us um, something like four and a half years of work on the amazing archive of one of Sweden's most important um, architects. Uh, I am just one of the authors, of course, and, and you will get very much my perspective on this book in, in this fairly short talk. Um, as you can see from, from this image, the book is a big one. It's 700 and something pages with nearly 900 illustrations, with nearly 300 pages of just writing of, of an account of Sigurd Leverance's life and work, in, uh, researched mainly by Johan Ern from the original uh, material here at ArcDES, um, and with an introduction, a critical introduction by myself, and, and a large section of the book dedicated to it to a selection of the, the drawings, photographs, and other materials that we hold here at the museum and that we discovered. As well. um, it's hard to know even where to start for with a project that's so, um, that we've lived with here for, for so long um, and is now in a way closed in that the exhibition has closed, but the book itself lives on and we hope will live on um, in, in the culture for a very, very long time. And I think my first, of course, my first, encounter with Sigurd Leverance's work was through books and through publications. I remember um, when I was a journalist in the late 90s, early 2000s, at what was then uh, Building Design magazine, then a weekly architecture magazine. We had a fantastic library and the librarian, Sue Foster, who, who kept it in order. And one of the books I remember discovering there um, was Colin St. John Wilson's well-known book, almost legendary book, you could say, about Sigurd Leverance, The Dilemma of Classicism, a book published by the Architectural Association, and mainly famous for its sandpaper cover, the, this dust cover of the book that was made of a kind of glass paper printed with a with the pattern of bricks from Sigurd Leverance's brick churches and legendarily would stand in your bookshelf whatever it stood next to would be just gradually destroyed by by this kind of aggressive um, book cover, a very beautiful material thing. And I confess that when um, when I left building design, I stole that book. I, I don't feel so guilty about it um, because later on, building design would get rid of its library entirely. Um, but the copy of that book I have is, is um, an ill-gotten gain. But in any case, my experience of, of Sigurd Leverance's work was through that book. And, and that was the same for many of the architects and, and uh, practitioners and teachers and so on that I grew up writing about as a young journalist um, in London. It was amazing to me that, that Leverance's work was such a strong kind of touch point for so many architects that, that were forging a practice in those times. Um, you could visit... Adam Crusoe and Peter St. John's office, or Florian Bagel and Philip Christou's studio at London Metropolitan University, or young architects like Simon Henley or Patrick Lynch or many others, all of them would have Sigurd Leverance as a touchstone. Um, Tony Fretton, of course, another one who, whose work is very influenced by, by Leverance. It's been a pleasure to see many of those people in Stockholm as part of the project to see, to see the exhibition or to, to speak in our symposia and so on. But of course, one had a sense as I was learning about architecture as a young person um, that that this Leverance character was someone to be reckoned with. And much longer in 2017, much much later in 2017, when I got the job to be the director of um, of ArcDES here in Stockholm and moved here with my family, one of the big motivations was the knowledge that Leverance's collection was here. Um, ArcDES is the National Museum of Architecture in, in Sweden and of design, but we collect architecture. And the collection here is one of the largest in the world related to architecture. We have nearly 4 million objects um, related to the history of Swedish modern architecture between around the mid 19th century and the present day. And right now we're working on the full breadth of that amazing, um, that amazing collection. 
working towards a new collections exhibition, a new a new sort of permanent exhibition um, of the collection that we we plan to open in twenty twenty four. When I when I arrived in two thousand seventeen, the collection had not really been exhibited very much, despite the fact that Arcdes has been an ex- has been a museum first. It was called Architecture Architecture Museum, the Museum of Architecture, and later changed its name to Arcdes. But it's one of one of Europe's earliest architecture museums, founded in nineteen sixty two, um, and founded partly to be a collecting institution of a generation of architects who were dying and and whose work had no obvious place to go. Um, The Swedish Institute of Architects had collected that work but couldn't continue to do that. And so the museum was kind of made into a vehicle of of, um, collecting uh, large scale architectural archives, comprehensive and complete architectural archives um, of Swedish practitioners. We now hold well over 600 such archives and as I said, 4 million objects an intimidatingly large amount of material. And because we knew we wanted to exhibit this fantastic material, we we needed somewhere to begin. How do you begin when you have four million architectural drawings in your basement? Um, we decided to begin with one of the most significant parts of that collection, and, and that was Sigurd Leverance's work. So, so there were two motivations. One was the knowledge I had coming to Sweden that Leverance's work was uniquely interesting to many generations of architects around the world, not just in London, but but uh, in the US and um, especially in Japan and in China increasingly, but also because we had the stuff. And Leverance's, Leverance's material here at the museum consists of more than 13,000 catalogued objects, um, most of them drawings, but also photographs and personal objects, objects that were collected from his uh, final working room, some furniture, um, some three-dimensional objects, things that he had in his um, in his apartments and his working rooms um, throughout his life, maquettes of sculptures from his buildings and um, and so on and so forth. We also have a, a large amount of material that is not catalogued, but you, we refer to here in Swedish as handling as objects that have to do with his business and his um, his correspondence and so on. What's fascinating about the collection, though, is of course we also have many other architects of the time who Leverance knew. So we could look at Gunnar Asplund's archive and learn really a lot lot about um, about Leverance's and Asplund's, Gunnar Asplund's relationship and their collaboration, of course, most significantly on the Woodland Cemetery um, here in, in uh, Stockholm. And we'll come back to that. But of course, this amazing material of 13,000 objects um, was something we really wanted to dig into and use as a test case for how we might handle the collection at large. Of those 13,000 objects, the majority is drawings. Um, And the book um, is designed mainly to be, I would say, uh, a a resource dedicated to a large um, selection of his drawings. For me, the value of architectural drawings is something we have to argue for. Um, As I said, my own collection here at Art Des, the, the collection here had been considered mainly a kind of research resource Um, not much exhibited, not much researched as a museum collection would be researched, but considered a kind of archival resource for historians and for architects working on on historic buildings who needed the original material. But I believe not only that architectural drawings are extraordinary artistic objects, or at least can be, and that a broad public can respond to them in a way um, that is just as, as vital and just as engaged as they might to any other modern artwork. But also that partly because of the way that uh, the broader culture is developing, people are more and more familiar with with diagrammatic abstractions of of things. We understand um, architectural drawings now, not just as an opaque technical language, but as artistic works, as as works in a language that, that we can understand. So I think architectural drawings are something we should exhibit and we should be proud of, we should try to bring to a broader audience. Of the 13,000 um, more or less drawings in, in uh, Leverance's archive, one of the biggest tasks was to narrow that down to a number that could be comfortably um, fitted into a book, even a book of this scale. So my colleagues, Johan Ern and, and Mikael Andersson spent the lion's share of their time digging into that archive, looking at every single object, um, and I'm trying to piece together not just a biography of, of Leverance from that material, but also making a selection 
narrowing down from 13,000 objects to say around 900 that are in the book. And we further narrowed that down from 900 to about 600 objects in total in the exhibition, about half of which are in fact drawings. So this kind of narrowing um, down is of course, of course means to some extent sort of choosing value bought in Swedish, we, we choose things away, we take away things. Um, and that's a painful process. There's, of course, another book that you could make with an entirely different selection of drawings. Um, the what we tried to do is to is to or what Johan especially tried to do is to make a selection that reflected the breadth and nature of the collection. So it's not just the greatest hits, although the greatest projects are, of course, in there with with iconic drawings that have been published before. But there are also a large number of um, a large number of objects from the selection that reflect the nature of the archives, and that means that there's personal photographs, some of which are quite hard for even us to decode. We don't even know what some of them are of. We don't know why he took them. We have no um, narrative. He would have known, and he kept many of these photographs and, and visual resources as references, you know, for himself. We chose to not encourage some correspondence in the in the selection we've made for the book, um, and a wide variety of of other objects. As I say, reflecting the breadth of an architect's production, not just trying to be diagrams that explain buildings to people. Um, I can show you a few pages from the book before we get into a broader um, a broader narrative perhaps about leverance but this slide is is um from the book from a selection of uh beautiful photographs that sort of introduce the reader to, to this very large book and to to Sigurd Leverance. this is Sigurd Leverance, as you can see is a fairly old man um in his working room at his home in Skana in the south of Sweden where he lived um, with his wife until 1970, when he when he moved to his final working place and and um, and home in Lund between 70 and 75. So this is this is him at around you know 80 years old, 75 to 80 years old. And in a way, this is the picture of Leverance that is left to us by history. Um, at the end of his life, there was a huge interest in, in Leverance, um, from, especially from younger architects. Um, he would produced these two extraordinary churches fairly late in his career, his two last large scale buildings, uh, St. Mark's Church here in, in Stockholm um, and St. Peter's Church uh, in, in the south of Sweden, in Klippan. And those two brick churches uh, sort of made him famous again, if you like, and, and brought him to attention of, of, a, of a new generation of critics. Um, that was when, uh, th these were the buildings that Collins and John Wilson and Rainer Barnum and other international critics looked at and, and included in their books and histories. But also here in Sweden, there were a group of younger architects who you could say dedicated part of their lives and careers to to his legacy, to helping him with his um, final projects and so on, especially after his wife died and and they took photographs like this one um or, or arranged for this kind of access to leverance late in his life and and this is a picture of a of a man deeply engaged still with his work of course but of course it paints a picture of, of somebody who may be a little bit removed from the world no longer living in in a metropolitan center not accepting invitations to speak and to teach and and, and a myth grows up around leverance that has to do with um with him being a kind of silent individual genius, maybe even a kind of priest-like figure. Um, but Johan's, my colleague Johan uh, research focused on a broader timeline than just this image of him, especially his work in the 1920s and 30s, where Leverance was a very busy commercial architect. And, and filling out that part of the timeline in the book and in, in the exhibition has allowed us to see a much richer picture of, of Leverance that, that perhaps we don't normally see. But of course, we wanted to include um, images like this one in the book. Um, the book is arranged into, into three main um, sections. The first section is, is writing, and, and as I said, a, a fairly long critical essay by me dealing with Leverance's um, reputation, if you like, how his international reputation grew, what people said about him and why. Um, and trying to try to work with those interpretations and work against some of them in, in the bit the way I've just described. 
this first section of the book um, includes my own quite long critical essay dealing with um, Leverance's reputation and dealing with the views of him from outside Sweden, some from inside Sweden, and trying to understand why it is that this picture of Leverance as a kind of lone, rather hermetic genius who couldn't be followed and who followed no one and so on, why, how this grew up, this this idea. Um, and work, trying to work against a little bit some of the received wisdom about Leverance's reputation. And, and a lot of that um, interpretive work is done building on my colleague Johan Ernst's lengthy biographical um, uh, account of Leverance's life and work, which is the lion's share of the writing in the book. Um, one of the things that Johan tried to really focus on is, is, is a longer timeline, or let's say a more even timeline of Leverance's um, life and work. He focused particularly on the 1920s and 1930s when Leverance was a busy commercial architect running an office in the middle of Stockholm, part of a thriving and interesting developing architecture and art context here in the city um, that, that he was a, an important contributor to, um, very much an urbane metropolitan figure contributing to ideas about what a modern city would be in Sweden. Um, that he then left um, Stockholm later is of course also fully accounted for, but, but this, this kind of broader view of Leverance's work is something we've really worked hard to achieve both in the book and in the exhibition. And Joanne's account of Leverance, um, as you see from this page, focuses on the places that he lived. This is a spread introducing um, his move in 1943 to Eskilstuna, a city about an hour and a half away from Stockholm, um, which was an industrial city where Leverance and his wife bought a, bought a factory um, and in fact lived above the factory where, where Leverance's business um, uh, Edesta was was located. Edesta was a company that he a manufacturing company that Leverance directed, um, which produced everything from everything that one would describe as today as architectural ironmongery, door handles, window systems, even facade systems, um, a lot of typography and signage and and furniture, especially for commercial and shop interiors. Um, this um, this production was very important to Leverance. He, he had been trained as an industrial designer and was really keen to to be closer to the manufacturer, the the um, manufacturer, which was located in Eskilstuna by this time. So, so you what you get in the book is an account of these different places Leverance lived and moved to and what he did while he was there. So it's always trying to provide a bit of a context um, for Leverance's work. The second large section of the book is dedicated to photography, new photography of, of Leverance's work, um, taken by the architectural photographer Johan Delin. Johan is a fantastic, he's an architect himself and, and a talented photographer um, who's worked, I know, with, with lots of uh, interesting British architects, not least 6A, where he used to, where he used to be an architect. Um, but we commissioned Johan to, to travel the country and, and to take new photographs of, of Leverance's work all at the same time. Um, you see from this photo, this is a picture of the Villa Eerdstrand just poking up above the foliage. Um, Leverance's only large um, villa, really, um, that was uh, that's located in the south, um, the south of Sweden, in a resort called Falsterbo, um, completed in 1937. What's nice about Johan's photos is that they were taken in the springtime uh, and in the summer, um, and have an amazing kind of feeling of, of, of the, the Swedish landscape um, flowering and blooming around the buildings, but um, an extraordinary um, piece of work that Johan's done. So you see an account of Leverance's um, buildings also visually. And then the third large section, um, by far the largest, is a chronological um, collection of Leverance's um, drawn material and, and other things from, from mainly from our collection. This is introduced by a critical essay by by the historian Mikkel uh, Anderson, who who did um, who assisted Joanna with the with the curatorial work on the archive. Um, the larger projects like the Resurrection Chapel at the Woodland Cemetery get a kind of introduction of this kind before we dig deeper into um, into the the drawings themselves. Um, and the way that we've tried to present the drawings is, I think, also um, hopefully. Uh, interesting and, and, and a little bit um, different from many architecture books. This is a good example of a, of a beautiful perspective drawing of the Villa Eerdstrand, the same house that you saw in the photograph before. 
And you see that we've printed, that we photographed the drawings um, in a very careful way um, to include all of the damage and all of the all of the ways in which the object itself is presented in the archive. We haven't presented it as a drawing. We could have easily kind of cropped this or done some kind of version where you just see the black um, the, the black lines on a white ground. But we've presented each of the drawings and each of the objects in the book very much as an object. So you see that they're torn and folded and even wrinkled in this case on the on the left hand side. I think this uh, this enhances the feeling of the objects being um, being working objects. On many of the objects, you'll see pieces of tape or or holes where they where the objects have been pinned up. You see Leverance's own scrawls or even the client's scrawls on them, and and this uh, for me enhances the feeling of entering an archive rather than being taught something pedagogical about about Leverance's work from our point of view. When it's photographs, of course, we 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 present the photographs more as more as images so they're scanned and and um and presented uh, as images but this is also an interesting we think way to present the photographs this is a selection of photographs taken on site at st peter's church in clipan in the 60s uh, you can see the building under construction and there are a very large number of these drawings so we chose to show a large number of them we don't know why all of these photographs were were taken what was interesting about them some of them seem to be trying to trying to capture a kind of atmosphere on the building site you see the beautiful photograph in the middle on the left you know brickies sitting down having their coffee break in the top left you see Sigurd Leverance always elegantly dressed on site um, and then in some cases you can see that they are that the photos are intended to try to tell you something about how the building was made we've chosen to to leave that interpretation open to the to the reader but include more rather than less um, in order that the journey through this archival section of the book is also a journey of, of discovery and imagination for the reader. It's not It's not all highly curated by us. Um, this is another example of that. We commissioned uh, new photography um, of, of all of the three-dimensional objects too, um, including this famous chair um, designed very, very late in 1974, the year before Leverance died, um, the Terrible chair, a chair that he imagined um, manufacturing, in fact, and, and could have been flat packed and, and sent um, in the post, a kind of proto IKEA idea. Um, but it's a very beautiful chair that Leverance designed. Um, he had many of these examples, examples of the chair in his studio um, and photographed them there for pro pro promotional purposes. So you see some of those photographs or the negatives of some of those photographs on the right hand side, rather than choosing the perfect picture, which is to show the object, of course also get a bit of that atmosphere of Leverance in his studio together with his collaborators other architects and, and the president of the company who was going to produce the chair um, you know having a discussion around the table um, the book then is a, a kind of book that I was going to say before and, and uh, didn't go into it's, it's a kind of rare project it's of course a, a book we made in, in to be a book that coincided with this exhibition, the uh, Sig Leverance Architect of Death and Life, that was um, that was a, an exhibition that many many thousands of people see, saw here at Arcdes. But of course, a book lasts very much longer and can do things that an exhibition cannot do, especially the more detailed account of, of a life and work of an architect. Um, it's interesting to reflect that when I moved from London to Stockholm, it was partly maybe because there is no institution really in the UK who is likely to make a book like this or really has the mission to make a book like this. Of course, we know there's no architecture museum in the UK. There are many museums covering architecture well, um, from the Design Museum to the Victorian Albert Museum and, and, and even other smaller actors. But the resources and time that's required to to sift through a collection of 13,000 objects with, with the kind of expertise that a historian like Johan has to, to be able to write that into a, a, a coherent history and then to, to publish it is an expensive and, and time, time uh, it creates a, a lot of time. Um, I think it's really important though that this kind of work is done and not just in the academy. The most likely place for a project like this to happen would I guess be now in the context of university and maybe maybe a PhD, but there aren't so many uh, PhD students these days looking into individual artistic archives of, of architects, at least to my knowledge in the West. 
their, their areas of interest tend to be more narrow or tend to be focused on the many important contexts for architectural production, um, be that kind of the economics or politics of, of architecture um, and, and so on. So, so the work of understanding the, art, the artistic, the totality of, an art, of the artistic production of an architect um, is, is work that is really not being done systematically in the UK. And one thinks of the Royal Institute of British Architects' fantastic collection, which at the moment sits at the V&A and is soon to be moved away from the V&A. Um, there are very few people looking at that archive in the context of producing um, publications like this one. And, and you know, the, the Swedish situation is perhaps a little bit of a, uh, a warning to, to Britain. For a very, very long time, this kind of work was not really being done in Sweden either. Um, the archive was not being exhibited or, or published in, in this kind of context. And what that means is that the profession itself loses sight of the history of its own field. If, if the material is not available through publications and through exhibitions, um, we cannot any longer see the artistic tradition of which we are a part. Um, and I think that that is a severe loss for an architectural culture. Um, in the UK, we have fantastic people um, starting independent publishing houses, trying to trying to cover this ground themselves and doing it wonderfully well. And I know that some of the other speakers in this book week series for the Architecture Foundation will be those people. But um, I really believe that either the Royal Institute of British Architects or one of the museum institutions in the UK needs to begin to, to take on this role, to appoint, to have chairs for architectural historians um, in their institutions who can work in a long-term way to, to make available material like this one. Um, I don't have time now, and the, the project of this um, this talk was not to give a full account of Sigurd Leverance's life, it was more to talk about our, um, our book project and our exhibition project. Um, so maybe in the interest of brevity, I will I will leave it there. Um, I have much, much more I could say, of course, about, about Leverance's um, life and, and those lectures are available in other places online. The Canadian Centre for Architecture uh, invited me to give a lecture about Leverance, which is which is available on YouTube and, and is perhaps um, the fuller account of our our ideas about Leverance and, and uh, what, what kind of story we were trying to tell in the exhibition. Um, but as to the book, um, just to conclude, I'd really like to just mention um, some of the people who are involved in in a book like this, and so as not to um, not to miss anyone, I'm gonna I'm gonna open my list. Um, a book like this is is impossible to do without a very large number of um, of, of collaborators. Um, it's also impossible to do first and foremost, I think, without the financial and political independence of of Swedish museums. Um, we have the independence as an institution to be able to dedicate our resources to a project like this. And for that, we're very grateful to the Swedish state. Um, but the, but in terms of the, the project itself, um, the you know as I've mentioned, the, us, us three who are named on the front cover are just a tiny, um, a tiny uh, group, a, a tiny sort of fraction of the people who actually worked on it. Let me just make sure I have the list of um, people in front of me. Um, so, Secret Leverance, Architect of Death and Life. Um, the, the most important people whose, whose work I've not gone deeply into right now are, are the graphic designers, of course. Our graphic designers were Malmsteen Helberg. Malmsteen Helberg are one of um, Sweden's most important graphic design practices. Um, and dove into this into this project with an uh, amazing enthusiasm. Um, the the reality of handling a kind of visual resource this large is extremely challenging for any designer and graphic designers who are watching will know um, how difficult that is. Um, the their their work has been astonishing, really managing the flow of information and of, of visual material and trying to find ways to systematically present it. They. Um, created a, a custom typeface. This typeface that you see on the front page of the book is um, is, is a typeface they designed, um, a display typeface they designed, which we also used in the exhibition. I think you can see it's very much related to and, and inspired by Leverance's own typography, um, which there are many samples in the book. It's fantastic typography, especially in the 20s and 30s. Um, they made this very beautiful front cover, which is a kind of poster-sized print of this lovely photograph by Johan Deline 
of, of St. Peter's Church, which folds all the way around the book in a, in a kind of alluring and luxurious way. And it was them, together with us, who tried to, who helped us understand how could we order the various um, sections of this book. They created these fantastic, um, you know, a section about text, a section about photographs, and then this kind of archival section, um, clearly kind of distinguishing them from one another and giving them a visual language. Um, one of the other, like, there, there are lots and lots of very detailed challenges about ordering uh, uh, information like this. Take, for example, Sigurd Leverett's most important project, perhaps the Woodland Cemetery, um, which, of course, he won in competition together with Gunnar Asplund in 1915. But his final projects there were as late as the 1960s. He was still consulting on this project. How do you make a chronological selection of Leverance's life and work? Um, with a project with and and also maintaining the coherence of a single project that has you know 50 to 60 years of, of history in itself and um, they managed to do that through very skillful systems of dating and and um and of presenting individual projects and um, there's also a comprehensive timeline at the back of the book of both leverance's life um, and leverance's work this kind of resource is also quite elusive so melson helberg are a massive part of of, of why the book is successful and they've recently been honored with a pri one of the most important prizes in graphic design um, here in Sweden, the Swedish um, Book Arts Prize for, for the best Swedish books of the year. Um, the book was chosen just last week, in fact, as one of those books. Um, so Stefania Malmsten and Ulrike Helberg and their whole team. Um, should also mention the other photographers. We had Johan Deline as as the photographer of Leverance's work, and it's a wonderful body of work that we also used um, in the exhibition. But Per Mirahed and Kala Sanne were also the the very skillful um, phot photographers behind the newly taken photographs of of um, Leverance's three dimensional work, the furniture and the design objects, and also of the drawings themselves, which were photographed extremely carefully and at extraordinary high resolution. We'll soon make a website or a web resource that will make um, many of that, much of that photography available to a, to a broader public and to, to anybody who wants to, to use it. Um, the publisher, of course, was Park Books. We had a fantastic collaboration with them and they helped us print the book in, in uh in germany and in, in a way that we're really really happy about um, the print is extremely carefully um the printed paper is extremely carefully chosen by melston helberg and i think succeeds in being neither a kind of um, too glossy shiny presentation but a, a, an appropriately um high quality presentation for for drawn material um the book is um, is out now by Park Books. It's in its second edition already in English. Um, so buy it while you can. Um, it's uh, it costs about a hundred euros, I think, which is expensive, of course, by any standards. But I think we think for the size, this book of this size, not terrible value. Um, and I really hope lots of people watching this today will will go out and buy it. But um, it's been a pleasure and uh, to to talk about it as a book. Um, it's also a great honour to be invited by the Architecture Foundation. Um, the fantastic work that the foundation does in so many different ways. It's been a pleasure to watch in the last years. Um, so thank you very much. And, and that's it from me.